you have a one more question? No, that, 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 we got to move and on. Coffee break. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks again, Jay. And so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the last speaker in uh, this uh, session this morning. Uh, professor Roberto Boli is Professor of Medicine, Physiology, and Biophysics at the University of Louisville, and he will present a talk entitled Repeated Cell Therapy. Roberto. Uh, thank you, Tim, and thank you, Jay, for inviting me here. I apologize for the mis, uh, uh, missed talk. Uh, it took a long time to get here. I wish I had walked, but it was raining really hard. Anyway, uh, here I am. Uh, so I would like to uh, go over with you in the next 15 minutes a new idea which is incredibly simple, really, uh, and yet I think it has tremendous uh, potential. So as always, I have uh, no conflicts, uh, and uh, it's uh, something that probably is not going to change. I'm probably the only one who doesn't. Um, before I, uh, I go any further, uh, lest I forget to acknowledge the collaborators, I would like to um, thank all the colleagues that have worked on this project in the Institute of Molecular Cardiology. Um, it's a very large group, um, and I particularly want to thank Dr. Stang and Guo and uh, Dr. Gampert, who have done uh, the preponderance of the work that I will show you in the next few minutes. So one thing that has always uh, fascinated me is that why do we expect one single dose of cells to work, right? Uh, does it make any sense? I mean, if you look at any other intervention we use in, uh, in humans, unless it's surgery, it's usually a repeated intervention. So why, why would we ask so much of cells that one single dose will, f will fix a problem that has been getting worse and worse for sometimes decades? like heart failure. Um, so a major factor limiting the benefits of cell therapy is the poor engraftment of the cells, which disappear rapidly after transplantation, regardless of the type of cell use. And this is, I think, has been a major change in the field in the last 10 years. When we started 15 years ago, we thought we could simply put cells in the heart, they would engraft, differentiate, proliferate, and that was it. That was just uh, the solution to the problem. Well, we now know that's not the case, and no matter what cell is used, every single type of cell fails to engraft. Don't be fooled when they tell you they engraft. Just ask what happens three months or six months after transplantation, and you will not find any evidence that any cell type used so far is still there in significant numbers. So there are a few numbers, but not significant numbers. So this is one study we published a few years ago where we actually measured number of cells with a very high resolution. We could pick up differences of 10 cells. We injected 100,000 cells either into intracoronary or intramyocardial in mice after infarction. And you can see that by 35 days, we are down to about 1,000 cells out of 100,000. And this has been repeated with many different cell types. So basically, cells, just like drugs, are metabolized. So because of poor engraftment, administering one dose of cells cannot be considered an adequate test of the efficacy of the cell product, right? I mean, if, you're, if you have a pharmaceutical agent that's going to be eliminated by the body, why would you think that one dose will solve the problem? However, interestingly, almost all preclinical and essentially all clinical studies of cell therapy performed heretofore have used one single cell administration. So uh, uh, we thought that this problem of poor engrafting, there are many ways around it, and Jay just showed some very tantalizing data which maybe uh, will help uh, solve this problem, this, uh, which is the number one problem in cell therapy. This is the single biggest problem is poor engraftment. So uh, there may be other ways, but one way which is very simple is to simply give cells multiple times, right? It's not rocket science. So we reason that just as most pharmacologic agents are ineffective when given once, but can be highly effective when given repeatedly, so a cell product may be ineffective or modestly effective when given as a single treatment, but may turn out to be quite efficacious if given repeatedly. Um, as I said, there are many studies clinically where you see a trend towards an effect. It's almost significant P equal 0.08, but it doesn't quite make it. And maybe that's the reason um, uh, this, uh, 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 the, 
the significance was not achieved. So why is it that, I mean, it's not, as I said, the rocket science. Why is it that no one has thought about giving multiple doses of cells before? Well, I already told you earlier one reason is the old paradigm. We thought cells would engraft. So basically, if you just give a lot of cells, you get a lot of engraftment. You get a lot of new myocytes, and do you don't need to do it again. So that was, we now know that's not the case. Now, in animals, in rodents particularly, giving repeated cell treatment is um, incredibly difficult. Uh, it's uh, because it requires several thoracotomies. We tried it in rats, and every single rat dies. No matter you know how careful you are, it's just that doing multiple thoracotomies in the same animal is very very difficult. And clinically, um, repeated intramuscular or intracoronal injections are hindered by logistics, safety, financial, and regulatory issues. For example, the FDA will not let you do multiple doses until you show that a single dose is helpful. Well, you know, if a single dose is insufficient, then it becomes kind of a, of a catch-22. So uh, first we wanted to see whether this idea of giving repeated doses is, uh, is actually valid. Uh, and so we did a study in rats in which we uh, produced deliberately a very large infarction with a two-hour occlusion, which kills most of the risk region. We waited 30 days to allow complete healing of the infarcts. Now we have a stable scar. And then we give three treatments 35 days apart of either vehicle or one single dose of cells. This is what everyone else has done so far, what we have done so far, just a single dose. And these are CKIT cardiac uh, progenitor cells, uh, one million cells intra, um, intracoronarily, or we give three doses at uh, 35 days intervals. So when we measure the total content of uh, CKIT cells at the end of the study, that would be 105 days after the single dose and 35 days after multiple doses, there is an increase, but not really very striking, um, much less than uh, what actually we expected. But when we look at the ejection fraction at different times, uh, so these are the yellow at the vehicle rats, single dose are in orange, and the multiple doses are in red. So the vehicle rats do what they always do. They get worse and worse over time. Single dose gets better after one dose and then stays there. With multiple doses, they get better after the first dose, a little better after the second dose, and a little better after the third dose. So another way of looking at the data is to look at uh, the change in ejection fraction after each uh, treatment. So in vehicles, the ejection fraction actually gets worse. In the single dose, it gets better with the first treatment and then no change with the second or third treatment. In the multiple doses, uh, it gets better after each treatment. Three points here, four points here, and five points here. So each treatment is associated with an improvement in ejection fraction. So another way of looking at, that, at this is the cumulative change in ejection fraction versus uh, pretreatment. So uh, control rats get worse. Single dose rats get better, but they don't improve further with further treatments as expected. But notice in the multiple treatment rats that the total improvement gets bigger with time so that by the end of the study, instead of having a five point increase in ejection fraction, now you have a 13 point, um, uh, almost three times as much with three doses of, of cells. And of course, we don't know what would happen if we keep doing this with four, four or five doses. Now, does this, uh, is this due to a smaller scar? And the short answer is no, because when we measure the scar size as a, as a percentage of the risk region or of the ventricle, it's really not significantly different between single and multiple doses. Uh, and so uh, how do these cells work? How do um, these uh, uh, multiple doses help the ventricle function better? So I will uh, tell you so that you don't be hanging until the end of the talk. I do not know, so you can put your mind to rest. But I can uh, maybe suggest some hypotheses. So the first obvious uh, hypothesis is that these cells will uh, simply differentiate into new myocytes. So we, 
we, I, I forgot to tell you, but we transplanted male cells into female rats. So we look at the Y chromosome in these transplanted cells here in green up on top. And once in a while, you find one myocyte here with the asterisk that has the Y chromosome. Uh, but the problem is it's easy to show a picture, right? But the problem is always the quantitation. And when you look at the, when you actually count the number of Y chromosome positive myocytes, uh, you'll find that the non-infected region, which is the important region, because this is what determines ventricular performance, is not the scar. The scar doesn't do anything. It's the, the non-infected region that determines ejection fraction and the pump function of the heart. You get uh, the most 0.5% with multiple doses. It doesn't matter single or multiple doses. You get a very, very minuscule number of, uh, of myocytes derived from stem cells, which is clearly not sufficient to explain the improvement in function. Okay, so the second question is maybe the transplanted cells do not differentiate themselves. We also know that they disappear very quickly, but maybe they stimulate somehow the formation of new myocytes from endogenous precursors present in the host myocardium. Well, so to test this, we, uh, we did another, another thing in this study, which I did not show you, tell you earlier. We infused BRDU for 35 days after the first injection in all three groups and IDU for 35 days after the third injection. So basically in the multiple dose group, we cover with either BRDU or IDU the entire treatment except for these 35 days in the, uh, in the middle. So then we were look, uh, we start looking for either BRDU or IDU positive myocytes, right? Uh, so this is an example, and you can find a few of them. This is an example of one of them. That's an IDU positive mice. So this myocyte was born after the third treatment, right? In the last 35 days of life of the animal. Uh, but again, when you do the quantitation, uh, the same story in the non-infected region, this is the important region, we, even with multiple doses, the new myocytes that were born after the first treatment are only about 1% of total myocytes, not enough to explain the improvement in function. Okay, so we don't have, by the way, we did a similar study in mice, I don't have time to show it here, where we um, gave BRDU after administration of uh, um, cardiac uh, stem cells. And this is the mouse where we found the highest number, that's the whole mouse heart and the BRDU cells are in uh, red. Uh, and these are how many we find in the whole hearts. If you count them, there are about 25 with multiple doses. So 25 new myocytes in the whole section of mouse heart and not very much. So uh, transplantation of cells does not result in differentiation of the exogenous cells into myocytes. It does not stimulate significant endogenous uh, formation of new myocytes. So how do these cells work? As I already told you, I don't know the answer, but I think one important possibility that merit further exploration, exploration is to measure collagen content in the non-infarcted region. We know in heart failure, in chronic heart failure, there is progressive accumulation of collagen in the non-infarcted region. So here we did a picroserious staining. We quantified the amount of uh, collagen in the non-infarcted region, and indeed there is a very substantial reduction with multiple doses compared to either vehicle or a single dose of cells. Uh, the secondary uh, possibility, which may be even more important, is that we now believe that many of the cells we are using, certainly the cardiac mesenchymal cells, which are kind of uh, similar to the bone marrow mesenchymal cells. I don't have time to show them today, but we, we are using those as well. The mesenchymal cells or the cardiac progenitor cells, they reduce the infiltration of uh, inflammatory cells in the non-ischemic region. So here we measure the CD45 positive cells in the non-infarcted region, uh, as well as in the infarcted region. And in all regions, we see a significant reduction in the in infiltration of these inflammatory cells, which uh, uh, which are thought to contribute to contractile dysfunction by producing uh, uh, cytokines and other mediators that may depress cardiac function and cause further fibrosis. So this is a uh, whole new area of research which I think is fascinating and merits to be 
studied. By the way, <coughs> the uh, cardiac, excuse me, <coughs> the cardiac mixing camel cells, besides reducing the number of inf inflammatory cells, also seem to suppress the uh, nefarious actions of these cells. So when we incubate microphages with endotoxin and interferon gamma, so they become now M1 microphages, and then they, we co-incubate them with cardiac mesenchymal cells, the production of all of these cytokines is markedly suppressed. This is a logarithmic scale. So the, uh, the, the transplanted cells seem to inhibit production of deleterious cytokines by inflammatory cells, which could be another mechanism of benefit. So in conclusion, the benefits of cell therapy are significantly underestimated with only one, when only one dose of cells is given. Repeated administration of cells have cumulative beneficial effects, and as a result, they are markedly more effective than a single administration. Uh, the beneficial effects of repeated cell doses, just like a single cell dose, cannot be explained by engraftment and differentiation of transplanting cells, and therefore they must reflect paracrine mechanisms. So this is the conceptual framework uh, that these data support. When you give a dose of cells, there is an, a spike, an increase in the myocardial concentration of cells, but then this number decreases fairly quickly. Then you give a second dose, it goes up again, just like you're giving a drug and you're measuring plasma concentration. We think that every time we give cells, we are releasing exosomes or extracellular vesicles by these cells, which parallels the time course of cell uh, production. And function improves in a cumulative fashion with each single injection of doses. Now notice this uh, uh, solid red bar at the bottom. These are cells that are left because cells, as, a, as I alluded earlier, they, they disappear mostly but not completely. So you still find like 1% of the cells that are left uh, uh, at the end of the injection. And, uh, and if you give repeated injections, this number of long-term persisting cells will increase. Now, we have no idea what these cells are doing. We are actually looking at killing them now with a suicide gene to see what happens, if they're really important for function or not. Uh, but that's another aspect that needs to be, um, uh, to be addressed. Uh, uh, I, I gather I'm out of time, right? Okay, so I will uh, spare you the suffering of the, um, of, of the next slide. I will skip through very quickly and just go to the very, very conclusion. Uh, okay, so now this idea of uh, uh, the greater efficacy of repeated cells has significant implications. The concept that the full effects of cells cannot be properly evaluated with a single dose but require multiple doses constitutes a major paradigm shift that may fundamentally change the entire field of cell therapy. So, for example, when you look at the literature, what has been done in the last 20 years, right, the conclusion of previous, quote, negative studies could be questioned because the benefits of the treatment may have been underestimated or even completely overlooked due to the use of inadequate treatment protocols. For example, the traditional single-dose paradigm may be responsible for the borderline or disappointing results obtained in clinical trials of cell therapy, all of which so far have used a single treatment. But more importantly, and this is really, I think, the most important, uh, the protocols of future preclinical and clinical trials of cell therapy need to be changed to incorporate repeated experiments. So when we treat pneumonia, we don't give one dose of penicillin, it doesn't do very much, and say, oh, you know, that penicillin does, doesn't work, let's forget about it. We, we keep doing it until the, the disease is cured. We should do the same thing before we conclude that cell therapy does not work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto.